Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. I cold started Denver Eye Care and Eyewear Gallery. Um, April 1st, we opened up the doors of 2021, so uh, under a year ago. And um, I had Emma three months after we opened, uh, or three and a half months after. So um, my husband, I, I signed the lease to the location that we built out about two weeks before I found out we were pregnant. So um, I don't know that there's ever an ideal time as a business owner to have a child or be out on maternity leave, but it's been really cool because um, we're in a, a public shopping, like supermarket, um, strip mall, kind of nicer area. And um, we have patients pop in all the time. Is Emma here? Can we see the baby? Um, so that, that's been really fun. Welcome to the vision of leadership podcast. I'm your host, Ted McElroy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you find your wins, have a better quality of life and become the best leader you can be. Hey, have you subscribed to this podcast yet? Don't miss an episode. They're worth every single thing you paid for them which is nothing because they're free. I invite you to subscribe to the podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Give us a rating and a review on your specific podcast player. This helps us with our podcast rankings and makes it easier for people to find us. And as always, please support those who help support us. episode 102 of this podcast, Chris interviewed Justin Kwan, Michelle Andrews, and Richard Ruth. They pointed out that as a profession, we have done a great job of letting our patients know that myopia is not a big deal. If you can see 2020, there is no worry. It is the high myopes that are more danger. And as they said, that message is tragic. Any myopia has a higher risk of maculopathy, glaucoma, and earlier cataract development. In the MySight one-day clinical trials, only 4% of study participants who got ProClear one-days stayed stable in their myopia progression over the three-year period. That means you can confidently say, parent, by not going to a system geared to slow the myopia progression, there is a 96% chance your child's vision will get worse. This may take away some of the choice your child has in the future as to how they will correct their vision. Choice Not fear of the disease associations with myopia is what best resonates with parents when it comes to myopia control for their children. And with Cooper Vision's MySight One Day, we now have an FDA-approved single-use contact lens to lessen the progression of myopia in our patients. Contact your Cooper Vision representative to find out more about MySight One Day contact lenses. Welcome to the Vision of Leadership podcast. I'm Ted McElroy, and today I have a very good friend of mine, Kristen O'Brien, um, Kristen is the owner, uh, new owner, I guess, actually, of her own practice. She hung up the shingle about a year ago of Denver Eye Care and Eyewear Val- Gallery. I'm excited. I've known Kristen since uh, 2010, so 12 years. Uh, she and I met when they were sort of kicking off the student program for private practice clubs across the country, and their school was one of the first ones to have an established program like that. And I got to, to speak with Amir Koshnevez and my dear friend and idol, Mike Rothschild, a great American. And we got a chance to meet Kristen. And uh, Kristen, I'm just so happy to have you here with us today. Kristen O'Brien, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Ted. It's uh, truly my pleasure for sure. So uh, you've been on this podcast before, not with me, but with Chris. So that makes you a rare breed of a, of a repeater. We've had a couple of people who've done that, not a ton, but some, and, and that makes you extra special for sure. But 
when we were talking about uh, putting this together, and I think I may have actually mentioned it to you once before, but I don't know if you maybe thought I was joking, but then when I sent out the emails, and it was kind of funny, uh, this time I sent out the emails and like everybody responded. I mean, it wasn't like the last time it was like I got two people that responded to the email. This time everybody did. Uh, and then on top of that, my associate just happened to have a baby about three weeks ago. So by the time I sent out the invites, she had her baby a little early and it kind of put a wrench in my, in my uh, work. So I was really glad to get you in because I'd like to get a little bit of advice. <laughs> Happy to help. Yeah. So I believe we're coming up on a week shy of Emma's six month birthday. If they call them those kind of things. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. You got it. So as you were preparing, I think this would be really nice to have someone to talk about this because no one really discusses maternity, especially in your situation. I mean, are, are, you're in a single doctor practice, correct? Yeah, I, I cold started Denver Eye Care and Eyewear Gallery. Um, April 1st, we opened up the doors of 2021, so uh, under a year ago. And um, I had Emma three months after we opened, uh, or three and a half months after. So um, my husband, I, I signed the lease to the location that we built out about two weeks before I found out we were pregnant. So um, I don't know that there's ever an ideal time as a business owner to have a child or be out on maternity leave, but it's been really cool because um, we're in a, a public shopping, like supermarket, um, strip mall, kind of nicer area. And um, we have patients pop in all the time. Is Emma here? Can we see the baby? Um, so that, that's been really fun. So, I mean, do you bring her to work? I mean, is, how does the, how is that working? My original plan is that we were gonna, um, so I, I, uh, built out three exam lanes, but I only equipped one of them, um, in the beginning. And so I had put a pack and play and a changing table and, um, a boppy, uh, <laughs> in one of the exam lanes and fully planned on hiring a nanny to be at the office with me. Cause so I went back to work when Emma was five weeks old. Um, I took six weeks off. So I, uh, she was a week late. I stopped seeing patients on her due date. And, um, I mean, I knew I needed to get back to work fairly quickly. Um, not able to take the three months that, that a lot of, of women have the opportunity to take um, but daycares also, I, I just didn't want to do that, especially with how young, um, you know, she was going to need to be going back to, or I was going to need to be going back to work. So, um, I plan on hiring a nanny to have her there at the office with me. And so leading up until I went on maternity leave and, and had Emma, that was the plan. Um, and so that's what I was telling patients. So they were all stopping in, expecting her to be there. Um, fortunately for us, um, you know, nannies are actually really hard to find right now, childcare in general. Um, and so my husband decided to take a step back from, um, his, his role, um, in corporate America and stay home with Emma. So, uh, she does come to say hello. We're very fortunate that, that we could make that happen, but, um, my husband does stop by with her around lunchtime sometimes to say hello and for me to get my baby fix. Uh, so, um, sometimes patients will, will intentionally stop by. We're right next door to um, the local like burger joint. It's called Crafty Burger. Um, it's local to the Charlotte area. And um, so they'll they'll stop in right before or after lunch to see if Emma's there. It's kind of fun. That's great. I mean, and to have the blessing of having Chris to be able to step away and to take a, to take a, a you know, paternity leave mm -hmm. uh, was incredible. Uh, it's, it's also such a blessing that his company is willing to let him do that, you know, and, and um, that's becoming more and more of a thing. Thank goodness, you know, because it's always mm -hmm. been sort of just held upon moms to deal with it. But now dads are able to, to do those kind of things. And I think that's wonderful. Okay. So you're three months out, you open the doors. What, I mean, you've been busy with a bunch of stuff already, you know, how, how did you, how do you plan all this stuff? I mean, what, what kind of processes do you go through to try and plan how this is going to work? How, how to actually open up the practice? Is that what you're referring to? Or the maternity leave aspect of it? Both, because that's the crazy part. I mean, you know, one of them is hard enough by themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, this is my second time through a cold start practice. So the first time I, I opened a practice, it was right out of optometry school, and um, I had the fortunate pleasure of, of working with two amazing doctors, Dr. Um, Mark Wolmeyer and Dr. Seth Thibault, who had 
open multiple practices before. So I really relied on their guidance um, as a brand new graduate because I was still learning how to be a doctor um, as well as how to be a practice owner and, and cold starting. This time around, um, I had the ability to go through the Eye Care Advisors Cold Start program, which was really neat because I've been working for the last five years as an Eye Care Advisor consultant on the consulting side of things. And so to go through the program as a client uh, was was really fun. An outlined plan of, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that. Um, you know, it, it really separated it out on when I needed to get things done by, which helped me prioritize my busy schedule. Um, and I had a team of advisors that I knew I could trust um, what they were saying because it's what we've been advising clients um, for the last five years to, to do. And I've, I've seen many doctors open up successful practices. Um, so that, that made it a little easier of having, having a team on my side to help me guide through it. And even though I'd been through it once before, um, insurance credentialing is a nightmare. Getting on panels is difficult. Negotiating contracts, figuring out um, contractor bids, whether or not you're getting a good deal, or you're getting ripped off. Um, you know, what's the best equipment out there? Um, can I afford this or can I afford that? All of those questions, um, it's, I mean, they're all really time intensive to research. So um, it, it took a lot of the burden off uh, going through it as, as an eye care advisor client, for sure. As far as preparing um, for, for maternity leave, I mean, I really just kind of told myself there's never a convenient time to have to be out of practice. So I might as well be out while I don't have a ton of patients knocking down my door and I'm slowly building up my patient base. Then when I have a bunch of recalls coming in and everybody's, you know, trying to get in for their annual exam and they can't. So, um, although if we, I guess if we have children and, uh, you know, another one, we'll have to deal with that as, as the time comes. But um, it was, it was just one of those things where, it, you know, part of being a private practice owner that intrigues me and that I enjoy it is you, you can make it work around your life. And so, Having a baby was part of, you know, I always wanted to be a mom and it's very important to me. So making the business work around that um, was just a, just a reality. How do you go about time management now? Because that obviously is a completely different thing than nine months ago. Um, you know, what kind of steps do you do go through to put your time management together? And because again, like I said, it's, this is, you've always been a busy person. I mean, ever since I've known you, you've been doing about nine things at once. Yeah. So, you know, what kind of process do you go through for planning your life out? It's not work when what you do for work is also one of your hobbies and something that you right. really enjoy. Um, so, you know, two of the other things that I do besides owning my own practice um, right now is I'm the vision source administrator for the Charlotte uh, network. And then uh, I, I consult for eye care advisors. And the nice thing about those two things is that they, you, they can be done on my own time. So I can do it when Emma's napping, I can respond to clients. I can do it in the evenings or between patients, um, really whenever I have time. And I mean, there's a few, few things that need to be done at, at specific times, like our, our eye care advisors, monthly meetings or things along those lines. But otherwise, it's a very flexible schedule, um, which makes it really easy um, to to fit in. And it is a lot. But, um, you know, one thing with cold starting is you kind of work, work your way up. So um, I started off seeing patients Tuesdays, Thursdays and half day Saturdays. Um, and so I had time for clients Monday, Wednesday, Friday and evenings. And uh, I added on Wednesdays um, in October. So I'm Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, sorry, I'm Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday mornings seeing patients now. So I try and schedule any calls that I need to have with clients or any practices I need to go and visit um, just on Mondays and Fridays. So um, it's, uh, it, it works for me. Um, yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> But I mean, but you know, even still, I mean, all that stuff is fun. I get it. But if it's not planned well, it doesn't stay fun for very long. 
That's true. So you know, that's a schedule and a calendar that I share with my husband. So he knows when I have calls, so he doesn't plan to go mountain biking or something like that. When I have client calls scheduled or local meetings or anything like that has definitely been critical um, to being able to, to manage my time appropriately for sure. Yeah. And you know, when you're planning your schedule and his schedule and, you know, and the work schedule and all that kind of thing, it starts getting a little bit crazy. Um, you know, we, now that my family is down to, we're an empty nest. I mean, we went from full nest to empty nest in two days. That's what happens when you have twins that go off to college at the same time, you know, and they go to two different schools. So, but, but even we thought, Oh, well, once they're out of the house, it'll be a lot less hectic. Well, not really. I mean, just like you, I've got my finger in so many things in optometry and, um, and I didn't have enough to do. So I started doing a podcast with Chris and yeah, I know. And then my wife is a coach for, she coached cross country for a number of years. And now she still coaches swim for the high school. Uh, she's currently trying to get her master's in math and, uh, and teaching at the same time. Wow. Yeah. So we have to sit down once a week and just literally pull out our calendars and go, okay, what do you got planned this week? And, um, you know, so we don't end up stumbling all over each other. And I think it's been really helpful to have that hour. We sit down, sometimes it doesn't take about 15 minutes, but to sit down for a good hour on Sunday night and talk about what the week's got, we have coming up for us. Um, I think that probably may have saved our marriage a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm being kind of facetious. I don't think it was quite that bad, but it felt like it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that my husband does outside, you know, it, uh, it's weather-based. So he is an avid mountain biker. He rides BMX bikes. He has taken up golf. So um, he can't plan his activities too far in advance because um, they're all weather dependent. So it's kind of nice because I, it give, that gives me the flexibility to plan my stuff first. And then, you know, if the weather's nice and I don't have anything going on, then, you know, the evening's his kind of thing. And, and uh, I, I'm hanging out with Emma. So. so as she starts approaching six months, um, how do your focuses change in what the practice does um, and what you're planning on doing. I mean, I'm sure she's getting to be a lot more fun. She's not just, you know, sleeping and, you know, dirtying her diapers anymore. She's up and around. So how has that changed your view of how practice is being done? Yeah, she's going to start eating some solid foods here in the next week, which um, I've been told to, to watch out on the other end. Things change a lot there. Um, you know, it doesn't really necessarily impact how I practice. Um, or anything along those lines, you know, it's uh, owning a private practice and doing the management stuff and seeing patients. Um, I mean, it all works really well with, with home life. Um, you know, as she's getting a, a little bit older and more mobile, um, she's probably going to be a little easier to have at the office um, with me, just because she isn't going to be, you know, eating quite as often uh, or as frequently and maybe taking more scheduled naps that I can plan around. Um, so if I do need to do, you know, inventory, since I, you know, have a smaller staff or, you know, I just need to catch up on some accounts receivable or something along those lines, um, you know, setting a, setting down a blanket and putting down some toys, uh, she can probably entertain herself a little bit better than she could have at let's say three months old. So when you, you got ready, you, you knew you had the practice coming up. What were some of the things that you went through as far as how, what's this practice going to look like? How, how are we going to design this practice to be me? So one of the things I was, I mean, we worked with, I worked with Karina K Studios, um, which was our design team. Um, and then they, I had an architect as well, um, yes, yeah, sign off on the drawings. But um, one of the things that was really important to me is that my practice not look like a traditional medical doctor's office. I wanted patients um, to really feel at home when they walk through the doors, especially being in a small town, Denver, North Carolina. Um, it's coined the Denver of the East. Um, so it has been fun going from Denver, Colorado to the Denver of the East. Um, but I wanted it to feel very homey. I wanted patients to feel comfortable coming in, grabbing a beverage and really 
looking around the the optical as though they're in an art gallery, um, which is part of the and I were gallery portion of our name. Um, so, you know, making, we have a, a kind of a modern farmhouse kind of look to the practice. And I can't tell you how many, I now have it on my, my like quick, uh, quick notes area of all the links to the chairs that we have in the optical and some of the light fixtures and some of the, some of the, um, uh, display cases, uh, that kind of look more like, you know, an end table type of a thing or something you'd put behind a couch or, or in a dining room. Um, just because patients ask where I get them all the time. Um, and they want them for their, for their own home. Um, so that was really important to me that patients felt comfortable uh, and and at home and at ease. Because for a lot of patients, going to any doctor is um, unnerving. And so um, that was that was I think my my key focus was was comfort and making pe- people feel like home. Because part of our office mission is to make sure that patients feel like they're treated like family. So I wanted them to feel like family too. And then as far as what kind of decisions you made of what the practice was going to do, um, you know, what, what kind of services you're going to offer, what kind of things, um, how did you make that your own? So I learned the first time around, um, so I graduated optometry school in 2013 from the Michigan College of Optometry, and I had my heart set on doing low vision. Um, and come to find out none of my patients needed low vision help. So um, I quickly nixed that and started working more with dry eye because everybody in dry in Denver, Colorado has dry eye. Um, and I had a ton of patients who needed specialty contact lenses. So that's something that I wasn't passionate about in school, but became passionate about because my patients needed it and demanded it. Um, so that's something that I've really been open with. Um, obviously our practice is full scope, primary care, high tech, um, and I've kind of been letting our patient base determine, you know, what directions we're heading in. And that's looking more along the lines of myopia management, um, along with uh, dry eye. So we don't have quite as high of a need of specialty contact lenses, although some would argue that myopia management is specialty contacts. Um, but we have a large dry eye base that's definitely underserved. So um, that's going to be something that uh, we will be Im- implementing um, as the practice continues to grow. And as far as you had asked me about like layout and everything like that, um, you know, having opened a cold start once before, I knew the areas that I grew out of quicker than not. Um, And having seen um, our 150 other eye care advisor clients open up practices, I've been able to see, you know, what layouts I thought um, would would work well for me. And so um, I knew I do fairly quick exams, or I guess I should say I'm more efficient in my examinations. And so I knew that having an additional exam lane, having three exam lanes instead of two is going to be important for me long term as far as growth um, and being as efficient as possible. Um, And then it was also really important to me that we have an edger um, because that was a a piece of equipment that I added later in my first cold start um, that profit from a profitability standpoint, um, I wished I had added earlier. So what were some of the other what were some of the lessons you got from your first practice? I mean, and these don't have to be, Hey, that was a great idea. It, I'd like to hear about some of the, wow, I can't believe I actually did that. I'll never do that again. What, what were some of those lessons you brought with you when you decided to open up these doors? No, I think one of the lessons that I definitely learned at my first practice was the type of person to hire. So I was very focused as a new grad on hiring people who knew what they were doing because I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, um, particularly in the optical or front desk or insurance purposes. I mean, we didn't learn how to read, you know, an an EOB or how to how to read an authorization from BSP or anything like that in school. And so um, I was very focused on making sure I had people who were experienced and were good at what they did instead of people who I enjoyed working with or who I thought had a stellar personality or were good people or humans to begin with. And so that's definitely been a focus um, at my current practice is making sure that I hire the people that I think will serve my patient base properly and train for the skills that they may or may not um, you know, have. So um, my optician to kind of take a step back and do uh, really only work part time and and do more lab work. And so unfortunately, you know, he he took a position elsewhere. Um, He still stops in to say hello from time to time, but um, that left us without an optician a month after I came back from maternity leave. 
And so <laughs> not, not to say that I wasn't busy already, but that was, um, that was definitely a shock. And while he gave us notice and I got up to speed on everything I needed to be able to do, um, you know, we, we spent about a month uh, looking for a replacement and just couldn't, we found plenty of qualified people, but not anybody that was the right fit. And I think that um, had it, had it been me in 2013, I would have hired a number of those candidates. Instead, I was more picky this time because um, I, I knew what it was like working with people that you, you didn't actually really enjoy. And so it um, turns out that my front desk, Brianna, who started with me April 1st of this of 2021, as my patient care coordinator at my front desk with zero optometry experience, decided she wanted to step up and um, learn to become an optician. And she has been stellar. And so seeing her excel as well um, has been has been really fun. And so investing in my team, I think, is something that um, I've also you know really learned to value. Um, and treating them like family, just like we, we want to treat our, our patients like family. So how are you getting her educated? Um, I mean, I mean, is it online stuff? Is it, she's, I mean, what, what kind of process is, is she planning on getting certified? What, what are the steps you're going through there? Yeah. So, um, with North Carolina law, she can only, um, operate when I'm at the office. So she and I have the same day off, um, which is Mondays. So I'm, I'm still typically at the office on Fridays, um, which is the day that I don't typically see patients, but she's at the office. So she's working under my license. Um, what was kind of fun is that she, you know, had the opportunity in the beginning to be at the front desk and overhear everything that our optician, John, was saying to patients. So she kind of already had an idea of, of of what was what, and she's very observant. And in a cold start, it's not like your phone is ringing off the hook to begin with. So she'd be sitting up at the front and she'd be done with her work. And so she would just be observing John and patients and how does he frame select and how does he talk about this lens or that lens. And then when we didn't have an optician, she had the, the ability to observe me and how, what I said and how I did things. And um, so, you know, after only the practice only being open for five or six months, I mean, she could tell me the difference between all the different types of anti-glare. She could tell me the difference of why we recommend a Verilux X design versus a, you know, a Verilux Max or, you know, why custom measurements are better than some hand ones or, you know, she could, she could do all of that already. And then um, I also um, am put, have had her doing a lot of the um, SLR training um, online through, through Vision Source. Um, so that's been helpful. And she's somebody that enjoys learning and is a kind of a self-motivator. So um, if anything, I'm telling her to slow down a little bit um, so that she makes sure she masters everything before moving on to the next step. But um, that's, that's definitely been fun. And I haven't trained an optician from scratch before, so um, it's, it's been interesting and it's also been nice to have the eye care advisors team, um, by our side as well, because there's a, uh, an optician, um, actually two opticians on staff who, who can help answer questions, um, as well, if I'm not available. This is one of the big benefits you have also of getting to view so many other people going through a process of just practicing and whether at at all different stages, because not only are you busy with eye care advisors, you're also an administrator for vision source. So you're in and out of a fair amount of offices just to see what's going on. What are some of the most common, you don't have to name any names. what, What are some of those common mistakes that you see on a regular basis when you're in these practices? Where, where do you see, wow, if they could just make this one change that I keep seeing over and over again, how much more successful they would be? Yeah, I mean, um, missing the mark of not talking about UV protection when you're in the exam room with a patient, I think it does a disservice to our patient's health, um, as well as to your potential second pair sales in the optical. Um, So whenever I'm reviewing the Optimat photos, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the macula and that that's, you know, our detailed central part of the eye and also the uh, part of the eye, it's really important to make sure we're protecting from UV and, you know, asking patients, do you have prescription polarized sunglasses? And it still amazes me to this day, how many adult patients who've been wearing glasses since they were six years old have no idea that they can get prescription sunglasses. Um, 
So I think that that's one area that I, I commonly see is, is doctors forgetting to talk about UV health. And we're so focused on blue light right now because patients are so aware of blue light um, that we forget that you get more blue light exposure from being outside unprotected than you, you do from a computer screen all day. So um, I think that that's something that I commonly see mix, missed um, that is a very easy uh, thing to to address in the exam room that helps patients and and your business's bottom line. Um, I also think that doctors are afraid to you know ask for for referrals, um, especially when you're building a private practice from this, from scratch. It's really important that you you get patients in the door, and the strongest um, recommendation that you can get is a referral of a friend or family member. And so um, asking our patients, you know, how was your experience today when they check out at the front desk, you know, Mrs. Jones, how was your experience today? Oh, it's fantastic. You know, well, that that's wonderful. We should, we really appreciate that. And you supporting a local small business, um, you know, the best compliment that we can receive is the referral of a friend or family member. Um, and if you have the ability to, to spread the word um, at church or on Google or on Facebook, uh, we, we would really appreciate it. Yeah. I think that's an opportunity that's often missed. I started, gosh, 28 years ago um, and in practice. And then after a few years of practicing with someone else, decided to buy out a practice here in Tifton from a gentleman named Bob Coleman, a great doctor. At the time when he started his practice, it was one of those amazing practices. And what I noticed um, was it started off as an amazing practice and it stayed there. So we've done a lot to try and continue to invest more and more and more in our practices. And that's something that I've seen. Uh, fortunately, not with any of the vision source practices I've gotten to visit. They've all done a good job with that. But when I was uh, traveling around with a couple of vendors, for different things, you walk into a practice and it was like walking into a time capsule and, you know, you, you don't see them putting that investment back into the practice, even if it's small investments, little by little by little, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how quick things get dated and how quick colors change. And, you know, I'm even this practice you were mentioning long ago was we were doing the little tour through my office as I was moving everything. I mean, we, we need to do a facelift on this place. It's been seven, eight years probably since we've done, um, you know, a remodel and we're, we're needing to do that and to keep it fresh, uh, and, and inviting for, for guests to want to come in and, and see us. But going back to the referral side of things, I, I completely agree. I think we, we tend to forget how important it is for even us while I'm sitting in the exam room to say to that patient, Hey, if, if you know of anybody you think would enjoy what we do up here, I would really appreciate it. If you just hand them one of these cards and I've got a bunch of stack of cards right on my desk, I'll hand them two or three of them. And I'll say, all you need to do is just write your name on it and their name on it and make sure they bring it to me. And they'll get the same benefit you get just to bring that card back to me. And you can figure out whatever that benefit's going to be for us. We offer them a complimentary OptiMap, both for the person making the referral and the person that's coming in with that card. And it, literally doesn't cost a lot, but they get so much out of that. Uh, I think that we get a lot out of the more important, just being able to say when they come back in though, Kristen, I really appreciate you sending Chris and your husband. I know, I know he's your husband, but you know, Hey, it still really means a lot to me that you meant you thought enough to send your family and to come see us. So mm -hmm. I think the follow-up isn't just giving them this little spiff. It's, it's actually saying, thank you. And when I started adding that component, that's when our referrals really started jumping. The spiff really didn't give us the big boost I was expecting it to. Mm -hmm. No, that's a that's a really great point. And and to that, when patients in the exam room, when you're talking to them and they say you know, something nice about you know your receptionist or your technician who just worked them up or something along those lines, I always take the opportunity to say you know thank you so much. That that means so much because we're we're really only as good as as our entire team and. It would mean so much if you could, you know, mention Brianna by name when you fill out your your Google review because, um, you know, she would really appreciate that, and that would mean so much to her. Um, and that's that's definitely um, been something that that we've noticed um, more more naming of of who in the practice or what they did specifically. And patients look at reviews, and um, when patients come in and I say, "How'd you hear about us?" 
you know, sometimes they'll say, well, I, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure I got somebody in network um, for my insurance. And so I looked at all the practices in the area and you had the best reviews. Um, so that's an important, a critical part, especially for a cold start who doesn't have the reputation that a long established practice does. What size community is Denver? Well, um, growing very quickly. So Denver is on the uh, south east southwest side of Lake Norman, and it's really kind of the last community that hasn't been um, revamped and uh, really built out. So the census demographic numbers are really skewed. Um, so the, the quick answer is I, I can't officially tell you. Um, what I can tell you is that the two private practices in the area were booked out quite pretty far. So I had a very um, good indication that uh, uh, that, it, that it had a patient base that, that needed additional optometrists. And um, it's growing extremely quickly. Um, Denver was supposed to add 6,000 homes in uh, 20, between 2021 and 2022. Um, so um, that's not apartments. That was, you know, single family homes. So um, growing astronomically quick. Is that how you decided to go there? Um, honestly, I wanted to make sure that I was fairly close to home. Um, one of the things with my last practice is the community that was most desirable to live in um, for me and my family was actually about a 40 minute drive from my practice. And, and that, that impeded me in that um, it was difficult just to pop in for a, an emergency patient here or there. Um, but it also, it separated me from the community. And I think part of owning a private practice is also making sure that you're involved in the community. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that wherever I opened was within a, within a 20 to 25 minute max drive from my practice. And right now it's 12 minutes door to door. Um, so I technically live in Huntersville, North Carolina. Um, truth be told, I didn't even know there was a Denver, North Carolina when we moved here. <laughs> um, so funny story when, when, so I, I moved here because Amir Koshnevis um, enticed me uh, to, to come and work at his practice for a right. little while. Um, Cause he had lost a, a doctor to maternity leave and then who didn't, didn't want to come back to practice. Um, so he needed some help and, and fairly quickly. And so when my husband and I visited the Charlotte area, um, we visited the Huntersville location and our Huntersville town, and we were kind of foodies. So we were just going to restaurants left and right, trying to figure out if it was a town we wanted to move to. And every time we'd have a server, we'd say, you know, we're thinking about moving here from Denver. What do you think? How's the weather? You know, what's it like here? And everybody kept saying, oh, I think, I think you won't find much of a difference. I think, you know, it'll it's about the same. And after the third or fourth serve, he told us that house, I said to my husband, I was like, how on earth could it be the same? And so the next server that told us that I was like, do you get snow here? And she was like, well, no. And I was like, well, in Denver, we get multiple feet of snow. Like, is it, is it sunny? Is it, I mean, most of the year, like, does it rain a lot? And she was, she looked at me and she's like, are you talking about like Denver on the other side of the lake? And I was like, no, I'm talking about Denver, Colorado. And she was like, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> So that's how we found out that there was even a Denver, North Carolina. Um, but at the time, my husband's job um, that he transferred with his company was on the other side of the city. And so we didn't want to move quite, quite that far. So we were looking for small town feel with large city amenities. And Denver was just kind of the next city out from the outskirts, I guess you could say. Um, so uh, I think long term, we would love to get more land and and live within Denver itself. Um, but like I said, I'm 12 minutes away from the practice, even though I don't technically live in this in the Denver city. Yeah, and and there's something to be said about living close to the office. Um, I mean, I'm I'm five minutes from my office, and it's really nice being in a small town to have that ability to be here quickly and. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten to the office and remembered I've forgotten something at the house and had to turn around and go back and get it and still make it back in time before huddle, you know. So um, it's it's really nice, uh, you know, if, if something like that were to happen to me in Atlanta, uh, well, I just have to do without it. You know, mm -hmm. you, know oh, you left the money back at home. Well, sorry, today you have to get a different deposit slip and we'll have to do it differently and we'll figure it or out. In Colorado, going to the office in your in your winter boots and forgetting your dress shoes. That's happened. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yep. 
So do you, do you find that looking at communities like this, what are the big advantages of a community such as Denver, as opposed to you moving to, well, or just relocating somewhere else in Charlotte? I mean, because let's face it, Charlotte's got a lot of places to go. So growth is a huge aspect, right? So people are moving to the area and looking for an, an optometrist. And so a lot of patients will walk in the doors and not know that we're brand new. Um, but the, the town of Denver is really unique in that it, it still has that really small town feel with people who um, it's very important to them to support small business and support local. So there aren't a ton of chains. I mean, yes, there's a Lowe's. Yes, there's a Walmart. But there's a lot of small businesses in this town. And um, I think that that was something that really radiated with me and and really helped kind of fulfill that mission that I have to make everybody feel like they're a member of the family and to treat them like family. Um, so, I mean, because, and to support their small businesses. So, you know, I always ask my patients, well, what do you do for work? Um, and so any opportunity I have to then in turn support one of my patients, small businesses, um, I, I try to every single time. We just were looking to do an expansion um, of our master suite in, in our house. And one of my patients is a contractor, owns his own contracting company um, and has his entire family. I mean, he, he has three adult children and they're, they've all brought their families to the office. And so um, I'm really hoping his bid comes in reasonable because I would love to be able to give him the business. He keeps bringing um, business to you. It may not have matter whether it's going to be comfortable or not a bid. You may have to take it anyway. It, it, I told my husband, I said, if he's even ballpark close to where everybody, anybody else comes in, then, then that's kind of what we need to do. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when you're, when others start saying to you, wow, small town, you know, what I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't really get the small town thing, you know, um, what's the benefit of being in a small town? Um, well, so I, I was going to say, I mean, there's difference between being rural, rural, right. Where you're yeah. the only option for miles and miles and miles. Um, and being in a smaller suburb with big city conveniences still. So you still get, I still have patients who drive or commute into Charlotte for, um, for work. And those patients are the ones that really appreciate our Saturday morning appointments and our Thursday late nights to be able to pick up their eyewear or their contacts so that they aren't having to leave work early. Um, I mean, when you look at it from a, a cold starting perspective to begin with, I mean, um, rural America has, uh, that's where some of the most, most profitable practices and lucrative practices, um, really are when you, when you look at the, at the metrics, um, because you don't have competition and you are it, and, um, you do have to be full scope, full medical to be able to provide the care that patients need. Um, for me personally, when looking at starting cold again, um, I mean, the, a community that I felt, a part of was, was really important to me. Um, and, and that I could see myself being, uh, at for a really long time. I mean, one of the hardest things selling my practice in Denver, Colorado is I, I loved my practice. I loved my team. I loved my patients. I did just didn't love living there. Um, and so when Chris and I moved here, it was important to us that we, you know, before we opened up another practice that we really made sure that this is where we could see ourselves having a family and um, it, it checked off all, all the boxes. And so um, if this is where we could see ourselves raising a family, then likely it's where there's other, other families like us who, who will need eye care. And um, so it, it just turned out to be, to be great all around, but um, having companies, um, you know, demographic reports done um, through Vision Source, geospatial analytics, um, as well as you know, with the healthcare realtor that we use, being able to look at traffic patterns and things like that was definitely really helpful in choosing the exact location um, that that we did. Did you have in mind what you wanted your guest to look like? I mean, and I don't mean that like. I mean, did you have a Okay, I'm thinking more on this age group of people, um, this level of affluence or whatever else you, I mean, how did, did you come up with that pack? Do you have the avatar in your head before you walked in the, into the idea process? 
Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, I was aiming for, you know, a young family community. Um, and that's the people that are moving to Denver, um, is families like mine, um, parents, you know, in their thirties, early forties with kids. Um, and so I prepared myself to, to do a lot of pediatrics. And, um, interestingly, even though that's what the demographic numbers on paper support, um, over 50% of my patients are, are over the age of 45. And so um, I ended up really attracting a lot of the retirees um, that were in the area or, pa- or patients that had insurances that would have required them to travel into Charlotte or uh, on, you know, uh, into the city um, because nobody else in the area accepts them. So um, being able to accept uh, or, and learning how to be profitable with vision plans like Davis and Superior and um, Spectera, which a lot of offices have dropped, um, was, I think, critical to how quickly we grew. Uh, when I compared my first year um, or uh, first eight months, nine months in business of my first cold start to the first eight or nine months of my second cold start, we grew three times faster. And part of that, I think, was choosing a location that had great visibility. Um, but a, another part of that was, you know, accepting insurance plans that typically have more of a bad rep in optometry and that none of the other private practices in the area were accepting. And we still um, have a very healthy average revenue per patient um, despite that. And, and I'm sure there are certain strategies that you put in place to make that happen. Um, can you give us one or two of those strategies that made that work for you? Um, well, part of it is the which lenses to prescribe based on which insurance company, um, you know, what lens per tier, you know, which anti-glare. Um, a lot of it, though, is, you know, using, using our edger when, um, when we're able which does vary by state. So some people can are in opt out states and some pay, some are in opt in. Um, so that's, that's one is making sure you're choosing the right, the most profitable lens um, in each category. Uh, um, and, you know, an, another part of that really is just accepting the plan to begin with. Um, patients have money to spend. They don't get to choose their vision plan that their employer provides them. Um, and so, you know, especially because we're growing, we're, we're able to, to take on the insurance plans that, that are maybe more of a pain to deal with on the back end, um, on the administrative side of things, um, but that patients are still willing to come in. And I mean, Davis gets a really bad rap because, you know, you think that they need to buy the glasses off the Davis Tower. I can't remember the last pa- Davis patient that actually looked at the, at the frames that are on the Davis Tower. I mean, we don't have them in our optical. We have them in a the back room. Um, where we have our kids' glasses too, but um, I mean, most of our patients will just pay to to get the frame that they want to to get um, because they are appreciative of the quality difference between what their insurance covers in full, so to speak, um, and the ones that are that are in our optical. Um, so I think you know, making sure, and each practice is different, right? Each. Uh, and everybody's goal is different too. So really making sure that you know what your practice mission is, right? If my practice mission was to, to um, be more concierge, then maybe I wouldn't accept that. But right now, you know, we want to make sure we we grow and, and get patients in the door. And um, those patients, even though the vision plans aren't the most profitable themselves, um, the revenue per patient still is, is pretty high up there and patients are, are willing to to, to stay, to support somebody local. So from the first point, from the first practice that you had, uh, that you started and sold to this practice, how has your mission changed or has it changed? And what is your mission? You know, my first practice, um, I was, I was very keen on making sure that I I just did the best exam possible, right? I mean, yeah, it changed over time. You know, year six that I sold it was different than year one. Um, But I was still learning to be a doctor then. And so I was so concerned about making sure that everybody's prescription was was accurate. 
um, and that, uh, you know, all my staff was taken care of and, and that all the bills were paid that um, I didn't necessarily focus on making sure that my staff was having fun, um, at least in the early years, right? Um, that coming to work was in, was enjoyable. I mean, not that I made not that I made it not enjoyable, but um, I think I, I take more time to kind of laugh with this with the team now and and have fun with them versus just being like, okay, well, we got to do this, we got to do that, we got to do that, because I'm I'm less worried about the practice succeeding because I I know I know it will if you if you treat patients right, um, you know, you, you really can't fail um, as long as you're being smart about about your business um, decisions and not overspending. Um, but I, I have to say, I, I guess besides that, my mission really hasn't changed. I mean, it's always been about making sure that the patient experience is positive and, and technology, reinvesting in technology, like you said, reinvesting in your practice to make sure that it stays state of the art um, has always been very important to me um, because that's what I, I learned from my, my mentors, um, most of them within the Vision Source Network. Um, which is is kind of a, a common theme that you see with with vision source doctors, and um, so staying up to date on technology, having an optos, having an eye care tonometer, having um, you know an edger, and and being able to um, appear auto four opter, um, you know, from day one um, has been has been great at, at my new practice. So um, yeah, I, I think. Just making sure you're you're treating patients right is is really the key to success in all honesty. You said just a moment ago, I mean, doing all these things, it 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 couldn't fail. And I mean, well, it could, but 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 what I want to I guess the question I want to ask is, um, is there something that you're doing right now that even if it failed, you continue to? I mean, I don't mean like you know a dumpster fire. I'm talking about if is there something that you would continue to do even if it were to fail? I mean, I really think what's doing, uh, I, I think I learned from Dr. Mark Wallmeyer, the phrase, what's best for your patients is what's best for your business. And I still think even if, even if my, my new practice wasn't doing better than my last one, or, or we were doing a lot worse, or, um, you know, I, I wasn't where we anticipated, I, I still would hang true to that, that philosophy, um, it's, I, I mean, I think even looking outside of the practice, I mean, I think if we all just treated each other as humans the way that we wanted to be treated, I think everybody would have a happier life in general. And so I, I think taking that to heart in the office is is true as well. I mean, I uh, while I believe that, you know, everybody deserves and, you know, ha- will have better experience if they have anti-glare on their glasses, I'm not going to... Um, hard upsell people, um, you know, and there's, there's a practice in the area that, um, if you are, uh, a minus three or higher and you don't get one, six, seven, um, thinner, lighter lens, then, then they will not fill your glasses prescription. Um, and I, I just, I, I think that's doing a little bit of a disservice to a patient that needs a pair of glasses. Right. Um, so I, I still think doing what's right for the patient is, is, is key. But I think going back to the doing what's best for your team is probably maybe even more important. Um, there was a former CEO for Darden restaurants, Darden restaurants, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, they're the ones that own Longhorn Capitol grill, um, the, um, Olive Garden. At one time, they owned Red Lobster, which kind of surprisingly, Red Lobster started in a town about 70 miles away from here, way across Georgia, a billion years ago. Uh, but anyway, um, by the Darden family. And Clarence Otis was the CEO at the time. And I was watching him on an interview, and he said probably the thing I think has been more important than anything I've ever heard anyone say. And he said that the experience of your guests will never exceed the experience of your team. And it really, when he said it, I was like, mm-hmm. that's amazing. I mean, you know, you kind of hopefully know that intuitively, but until somebody says it out loud, you don't really think about it. And that's when I realized that my customers aren't the people that are coming through the door for the eye exams. My customers are these 10 people that work with me every single day. And if I'm not taking care of them, then you know, let's face it, if, if their experience stinks, then so are my guest experiences going to stink. 
Amen to that. Yeah, and I think that may be the part where if everything else is failing, if I'm continuing to at least do that, I think the rest of it will kind of pull itself out of the out of the dumpster eventually. Um, you know, because they'll see that this matters, not just to the, you know, the, the roof matters, but they actually matter. And when they're treated like, as you say, just like human beings, they're going to continue to keep passing that forward to your guests as they come in the door. I think too, you know, one thing that's very important whenever I make any decision for the practice is that the team understands why, and that if possible, they have a hand in, in making the decision with me. Um, that that ownership um, that your team has, um, when they feel connected, I mean, it's theirs and they run with it. And um, it's it's really fun to see them taking on that ownership and and enjoying it and and getting getting benefit or um, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, feeling like they're, they're making a difference. Um, and, and really that their opinion matters and that they have, that they have input. That's important. Um, that ownership is, is also really important. You know, it's kind of strange too. We're, we're saying ownership about people who've not put any of the financial backing to the practice, you know? Um, and I really think they do, become owners. It's not, I mean, it's definitely sweat equity. It's, it may not be equity as in a check or a dollar bill, but it's definitely sweat equity. And I don't know that that's more valuable because sooner or later, I mean, well, you know, uh, Amir often had said, you can always make more money. You can't make more time. And they're investing their time into this place and what a great gift they're giving us. I mean, that's one thing that I learned while I was at Amir's practice as an associate is, um, you know, patients are only as happy as, as the staff are. So um, when you treat your team right and they're happy coming to work, um, it's, it's all, it's all uphill from or downhill from there. I mean, that's the, really the biggest hurdle is if you have happy people. If you have a happy team, um, you know, I, I remember my first practice, I hired a receptionist who was great at what she did in, in the clerical aspect of things. She was a super fast typer. She knew all the insurances in and out. Um, but she was always a half glass empty kind of girl. And, um, it was, it was tough to make her put a smile on her face. Um, at, at my practice right now, when I interviewed Kim, my patient care coordinator, um, Brianna, my now optician asked me how, how the interview went. And I said, she was just delightful, um, just a delightful human being to be around. And, um, you know, I think that, that having hiring the right people for the right positions, uh, is important, but also making sure that, that you, you know, you're, you're treating your delightful team delightfully, right. You're, you're treating them the way that they deserve to be treated. And, and in turn, that's the way that they're going to treat your patients. And, um, I, I agree with you. That's, that's what it's all about. All right. So we're going to jump back in the way back machine and go back to 2010. Uh, you're getting ready to, that, that was your fourth year in optometry school, correct? That was my second, uh, 2010. I graduated in 13. So that okay. would have been, yeah. Okay. So is this how you thought it was all going to turn out? <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I remember sitting on my 30th birthday, looking at the goals that I set that you, that you had me write down in, um, you and, uh, Amir had us write down our our personal and our professional goals. And, um, I had accomplished some of them, but I definitely hadn't accomplished all of them. Um, I for sure thought by 30 that I'd be married and have a kid and own a house. And, um, I had, I had accomplished owning a practice at that point. Um, but that was, that was about it. Um, but, it just took me a a few extra years to, to accomplish the rest of those things. Um, but if you'd have told me in 2010 that I'd practiced, that I would own, I would move to Denver, Colorado. I, I had, I didn't know that I wanted to be there. I grew up in Michigan. Um, and if you would have asked me in 2015, if 
in 2021, I'd be in Charlotte, North Carolina, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, it's been, it's been an interesting go, that's for sure. But, um, all of the, all of the setbacks that I've had, um, have, have all been for good reason. They've all put me in a better place eventually. Um, you know, so moving here during COVID, um, kind of changed, uh, the, the need at, at Amir's practice, uh, um, as far as, you know, partnership and things like that were concerned. And, it was kind of perfect because I was able to find the Denver location that I'm super happy at right now. Um, and, uh, you know, gosh, I, I just, I couldn't be happier. I mean, it, it really has all, all turned out to be fantastic and it's a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's, it's definitely not what I, I mean, I always knew I wanted to be a practice owner, but when I was a student, I, I guess I just didn't know how vast, um, of a career optometry could be. I, I never thought I would be in a consulting position because um, I've always been on the receiving. I've always been somebody who wants to just learn, learn, learn from other people. So I never thought I'd be on the the giving end of that. I, I never thought that I would speak um, speak to private practice clubs or or do that for a lot of 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 years, really, I was traveling almost every week to optometry schools or, or CE events or things like that. Um, never, I hated public speaking, never thought that I would, I would do that, um, as, as part of my career. Um, so it's, it's definitely been interesting and I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. Right. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, um, from the moment you might not have thought where you were going to be. I mean, we didn't know where you were going to be, but we knew how you were going to be presenting at that point uh, back in 2010, uh, watching people like you and uh, Roy Habibi and Jackie Thies and some others that were in that same group of people and just watching some incredible young, excited people about the profession before they were even to a point that they were going, they thought they had, they weren't really making an impact. And what you didn't realize is the impact that you were making was so refreshing for the three of us getting to see all you guys go through that exciting time and, and uh, to see where you are now. It's, it's just amazing. And it's, it's, I don't want to say, I, I mean, but it just gives me a little bit of pride to, to know that I've I had just a little bit to do with that. And uh, I, I'm just, Thank you for being with us today, and and uh, thank you for letting me share uh, your your time with your career. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for all of your mentorship over the years. And um, you know, it's it's been fun to watch the Student Optometric Leadership Network really take off. And those of us, like you mentioned, Roya and Jackie and Fahim and Ayatali, um, those of us who kind of helped start it in the beginning, uh, it's it's been fun to see it run on its own. Um, without us at this point, so it's it's good. So, but we wouldn't have we wouldn't have had the uh, wherewithal to start that organization if it wasn't if it wasn't for you and Mike and Amir. Well, thanks, appreciate it, and, th- and thank you for spending time with us today. Absolutely. Mm-hmm.